we cannot just go to the pills and surgery or you know say oh sorry we don't have anything for you we have to embrace uh, what mother nature has given us phytonutrients have tremendous benefit in human health and i think that's what i'm seeing is more and more people in the healthcare world embracing cannabis which then leads to more patients getting the help that they need Hey everybody, Dr. Axe here. Hey, welcome to this week's podcast. Today I have a great guest expert with us and we're gonna be talking about all things CBD, hemp, cannabis. We have Dr. Bonnie Goldstein. She is a board certified medical doctor and the author of the recent book, Cannabis is Medicine. Dr. Bonnie, hey, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. Well, I know we're gonna talk about a lot of fun stuff today, including one of our favorite topics and that is hemp and cannabis. And first thing I would love to just hear from you is I know that you obviously went through the traditional medical route, medical school. You know, what really turned you on to, as, as again, your book title uh, is Cannabis is Medicine, what turned you on to using ca cannabis or extracts from cannabis like CBD using that as medicine? Well, a number of years ago, after working in pediatric emergency medicine for uh, about 13 years, I was just burned out. And at that time, a friend had asked me about using cannabis. She was sick and she was looking into it for herself. She was really nervous about it because she's a professional. And um, I'm embarrassed to say I knew nothing. We didn't learn anything about the endocannabinoid system or about cannabis, of course, during training or even afterwards in my residency or even after as I became a physician and was practicing out in the real world. And I did the research for my friend and then started reading all these articles about the endocannabinoid system. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. How is it that I miss this? Um, but it turns out that uh, I witnessed her get some great results. And it was simple things like being able to sit at the dinner table and have a meal with her family rather than she was on pretty heavy duty treatment rather than being in the bedroom or on the bathroom floor. I mean, just made a big difference in her quality of life and allowed her to continue with her uh, conventional chemo that she was going through. And it just piqued my interest, started reading about it, and just, I was hooked. Wow. So talk to me about this, because one of the things that comes up all the time, and by the way, for myself, I, I believe that uh, cannabis uh, can be a great form of medicine, especially if used under the prescription of a licensed medical professional. I'm not in any way promoting recreational use, but I am saying this, this is something to think about. Why do you think today people have this uh, thought or a good majority of the population that cannabis is one of the most dangerous, you know, they, they see this as a dangerous drug versus pharmaceuticals, which actually are even more dangerous, at least that's my perspective. I'd love to hear you talk about that, about cannabis versus, you know, medications for your heart or for hormones or anything else. Sure. Which one in truth is actually more toxic or dangerous to the body? Well, look, all drugs have side effects. We know that. Even the cannabinoids found in the cannabis plant, those are the compounds that are medicinal, we know that they can have side effects. However, you have to remember, this is coming from Mother Nature. It's a plant. And when harnessed properly, look, I, I, tell, I write in the book, when you can have a cannabis regimen that is um, determined between the doctor and the patient, tailored to your specific needs, you do not have to have side effects. I have patients that are using cannabis for years and years, able to get off all pharmaceuticals and able to use just this natural plant medicine. And again, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to take it and I won't have side effects. You may not take it the right way. Self-medicating with cannabis for some people, they, have, they find their way and it works. But for other people, they may need medical supervision. There's no question in my mind that certain pharmaceuticals are needed for life-saving reasons. But when you're talking about quality of life issues, pain, sleep, anxiety, uh, mood, um, sometimes even motivation, uh, I have patients that just, they thrive on cannabis and their bodies just don't jive with pharmaceuticals. Yeah, you know, I, I, we're on the same page there is that, you know, almost, almost anything can have side effects, uh, even certain foods, if you overconsume some of them, and the same goes for plant-based herbals, 
And the same goes for obviously medication, but medications we know, if you look at the number of people, I think this is interesting, the number of people that die from prescription medications per year uh, or iatrogenic disease or death is in the hundreds of thousands versus the side effects, or if you look at the number of people that die from a nutritional supplement or even as we're talking about something like CBD is, I believe it's close to zero, it's very, very low. And something like cannabis is probably you know, very, very, very low as well. Any yeah. thoughts or, or comments on that? Yeah, well, the CDC stopped following, quote, marijuana deaths because there are none. Uh, now, here and there you hear a story, somebody, there is a story of a young man in Colorado, he overate an edible and he had a tragic accident. I mean, that obviously clearly is intoxication related. We're not talking about medicine. When we're talking about cannabis as medicine, we're talking about using it responsibly and using it in the proper way to eliminate uh, problems or issues that you're having, not to create new issues for you. And so um, in general, I find that the proper use, the proper regimen, the right products in the right dosing, it just, it, you know, for many people, it works. Now, there are people for whom, you know, cannabis doesn't work. And you and I both know that there's diets out there or even other things that we can do naturally that just for whatever reason don't jive with a certain person. We have to make sure that one of the key things I think that we've lost in the medical world is people listening to what their body is telling them and yep. following what works for them. I, I do feel like allopathic medicine does have this kind of one size fits all, which we know is not really a good way to take care of people. And the beauty of cannabis medicine, what I like about it is you can customize it, you can personalize it. There's so many different cannabinoids now that are on the market. Um, there's uh, ranges of dosing. I have people on five milligrams of CBD and I have people on 400 milligrams of CBD and everything in between. How, did, how do we determine that? Well, we listen to what the patient is saying and I tell patients, listen to your body. Yeah, let's dive in and let's talk about this, the difference between CBD and the difference between THC. But before that one, I want to talk about what, what is the actual difference in labeling you know, hemp versus cannabis? Because I know there's a difference in farming, but can you explain that, that difference for everybody? What's the difference between uh, hemp and cannabis, or are they actually the same thing? Right. Well, they're under the same uh, umbrella of the cannabis umbrella. Hemp is a form of cannabis. Um, I think those of us that work in this world are trying to get away from the word marijuana. Uh, so we're using the word cannabis instead, and then we're kind of referring to hemp as hemp. So the difference basically is um, that the cannabis plant has a large flower and it contains um, not like a flower, like a rose, but we call it a flower, you know, if you, and maybe some people have heard it re, re, uh, called a bud or, you know, cer certain generations called it the bud of the plant, but it's really the flower. And that's where the factory is that makes all of what we call the phytocannabinoids, the compounds that are in this cannabinoid family. And those are the medicines. The flower also makes these compounds called terpenes, which is just a fancy word for essential oils. And all of these compounds together kind of work synergistically or what's been described as an entourage effect to enhance each other's um, medicinal properties. The hemp plant does not have this big flower with all of, with a, a, such a huge factory. The hemp plant does make CBD, but you have to remember that the marijuana slash cannabis plant is the one making, genetically making these large flowers that are the factories. So you may be able to cultivate CBD from hemp, but remember, it's, you're going to have to have a pretty big field because the factories are small, whereas a uh, cannabis slash marijuana plant has a big fat flower that can make a lot of these compounds. The definition by the government is anything that's under 0.3% by weight THC. So if something is grown and tested and it's under this 0.3% um, by weight, THC, it is considered hemp. If it's over 0.3 or is 0.3 or over, it is considered a marijuana or cannabis plant. And the interesting thing is, is that there are now, look, people are amazing in the way that they grow things. They can grow a cannabis plant and 
have and breed down the THC a little bit. So you have this really nice, dense flower with lots of CBD in it that's got this powerhouse of other cannabinoids around it and other terpenes around it. So I want people to think of it kind of as a spectrum. You really have to understand that 0.29% by weight and 0.31% by weight is not very much of a difference, but it allows people to categorize some plants as hemp and the others as marijuana, even though they may be very similar to each other. Yeah. And so as we're talking about this too, though, primarily when somebody's farming, if they're below that 0.3%, oftentimes as well, those are going to be more of those plants today that people, many people are growing to harvest the CBD or create the CBD compounds from. So talk to me, what is the difference there between that compound CBD and THC? What effects do those two have on the body? And then do they affect one another? That's such a great question, Josh. So it, it gets kind of complicated, but let me try to simplify it. So CBD stands for cannabidiol, and it's been around for, you know, it's been in the plant for a long time. And we have to remember that when every, when cannabis was made illegal back in the late 1930s and early 1940s, it wasn't because of the science. They did not know the science. It was for social reasons, for financial reasons, for political reasons. So we have to remember that, that, that reefer madness propaganda was before anybody knew anything about these compounds. Um, in 1964, Dr. Raphael Meshulam in Israel discovered THC and named it THC as the intoxicating compound of the plant. Remember, it was the 60s. They were looking to see what in the plant is causing the intoxicating effect. At the same time, they had some isolated CBD from the plant, the same way they isolated THC. But when they gave CBD to young, healthy volunteers, they said, oh, we don't feel anything. So nobody really focused on it as a important compound. And it turns out that in the last two decades, all that research that has been done has shown that CBD has a tremendous amount of medicinal properties. So it's anti-convulsant. It has anti-cancer properties. It's uh, antidepressant, anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic, a very potent anti-inflammatory, which I think is one of its really important benefits in this world where everybody's walking around with all kinds of inflammation. Um, and at the same time, it's not psychoactive. Now, I want to be very clear that I do not categorize CBD as the good cannabinoid and THC as the bad cannabinoid. THC is just a different compound. And because of the way it works, where it binds to directly to the cannabinoid receptor, CBD does not do that. It binds kind of at an offsite. When THC binds to that cannabinoid receptor, which is in our brain, in our gut, in our immune system, and scattered throughout the body, it causes kind of this immediate effect, which includes some intoxicating effects. Now, I will share with you that some of my patients are using nice low doses of THC that are not intoxicating, and they do get uh, very nice medicinal benefits. But there are studies that show that CBD and THC together, for instance, work best for pain rather than all THC or all CBD. So for somebody who might be trying CBD purchased, you know, under the hemp um, um, title, they may find, gee, it doesn't do anything for my pain. And they kind of throw it out. And I say, no, 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 you might just need a little bit more THC in there to help. You won't get intoxicated with that tiny bit of THC in relation to a much higher amount of CBD, but you may get this enhanced, what we call that synergy to get that pain relief. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I see a lot of people talk about is, uh, you know, you're saying this THC being bad, CBD being good. That's not necessarily true. I do think though it is important to be conscious about which compound is, is good for what, which I want to get into in a minute. I do want to say this as well. I do want to mention the side effects. And listen, this is my own perspective. This is based on ancient Chinese medicine. If THC is overconsumed, and this is for just all the listeners here as we're detailing this, when THC is overconsumed or consumed very long at all, it actually starts to pull from your adrenal glands. It starts to pull essentially your energy. This is why if somebody smokes pot or does a lot of THC for a period of time, you'll start to, you'll kind of notice they'll lack motivation. There's this lack of motivation that happens. And in Chinese medicine, it's been known for thousands, which is actually the first medical reference mm -hmm. uh, to these things is in an ancient Chinese textbook. So again, as Dr. Goldstein's saying here, there definitely are side effects even more so 
with THC. You got to be cautious and you got to work with a medical professional. You got to work with a doctor or somebody who really knows their stuff when we're talking, especially about uh, THC there. I just want to put in that disclaimer for my own personal uh, you know, belief system in the research I've done. And then Dr. Goldstein, I do want to talk about which medical conditions um, are, are most benefit. Let's start with THC in terms of the research and then go to CBD. You know, what are, you know, when, when you're prescribing this, what conditions do you most prescribe THC for? You know, the one, two or three conditions sure. the most for CBD. Right. Well, of course, you know, every person is different in the way that they present to us. They can have the same check boxes, but you know, once, you know, that's why that hour long first intake with a patient is so important because you want to have all the details because you really want to dial in what, what can we really help with cannabis medicine. So there is no question that um, let's say patients with cancer pain, or severe pain from other causes, I have found that the combination of CBD and THC and what we call a lower ratio seems to work really well. So uh, something like a four to one ratio or a 10 to one ratio, meaning CBD is about four parts stronger than THC. I found that works really well for pain. There are studies that show that one to one ratio works really nice for spasticity, for chronic pain, and those studies were done in Europe using a pharmaceutical grade one-to-one -one ratio. So we actually have the literature. One thing I would like to say is that, remember, we are still prohibited on doing human clinical trials on cannabis, despite what the government says that we're going to be doing it. We've been waiting for years for the thumbs up, but it's still prohibited because the cannabis plant is still on the Controlled Substance Act as a Schedule 1. A Schedule 1 means no medicinal value, high addiction, and lack of safety. I know that to, I've been working with this plant for 12 years, including in many, many children, that it does not fit into this category. It must be taken out. And the reason is, is so that we can do the proper research, right? It's so important. Now, THC, I often find, can be very helpful in patients who are looking for uh, benefits for insomnia, whether it's with pain, anxiety, or some other reason that they're not sleeping. But in general, for most patients, I use a combination of CBD and THC. Um, I'll share with you a story. My own mother, who says it's okay to talk about her, she's in her 80s. She was suffering with severe chronic inflammation and pain for many years. She was, her generation, very reluctant to step into the world of cannabis. Um, but after a number of other interventions, even natural interventions didn't do much for her, I started her on a product that's about 25 parts CBD to one part THC. And um, she has done so well. She's now five years in and her, her pain level, which was like an eight out of 10 is now she lives with a one or two and she says she doesn't even notice it during the day. Not to mention sleep is so much better. So, and she's, she's not she's not having any negative side effects. She's not had to take any ibuprofen or any other kind of medication for many years now. You know, here and there, now she's active, she can overdo it, so she takes a little extra oil. The beauty of this is that what I tell people is that we are not, if, if you get started on a cannabis regimen, and I write this in the book, rule it in or rule it out. The first product you pick may not be for you. It might not be the product that's going to give you uh, all the benefits that you need. But you have to start somewhere and then you take that information and you use it to decide. So if a high ratio wasn't going to help my mother, we would have dialed it down a little bit, not a 25 to one, maybe 18 to one, maybe down to a four to one, depending on uh, the person's response. It's really important that you have a partner helping you figure it out if you're someone who can't do it on your own. Now in the book, I do try to give pointers like start here and kind of go ask yourself these questions. And if it's not helping, right, how long should you stay at a dose before you decide if it's helping or not? All these kinds of questions I try to address. And that book is, I want to mention, it's Cannabis is Medicine. You can check it out, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein. Uh, you can go on amazon.com. You can go on barnesandnoble.com or uh, just, just go ahead and search the book, Cannabis is medicine. And then talk to me about CBD. I think there's a lot less concern about CBD. It's something, you know, supplement companies 
uh, are, are putting out there today. Talk about what conditions CBD is most beneficial for when you're prescribing just a pure CBD uh, that has very little to no THC. So usually uh, inflammatory conditions. It seems to work really well for inflammation. Um, but remember, low doses sometimes don't do the trick. The funny thing about cannabinoids is, remember, they're made up of fats. And they are not necessarily, we, sometimes I joke around and we think we absorb every, every milligram of a fat that you take, but you don't. Uh, your body, for cannabinoids, what's interesting is we really only absorb somewhere between about 4 and 20%. So you can't take a very small dose and expect that to work because you don't really know how much you're absorbing. So I usually tell people, if you don't feel it, the dose isn't high enough, dial it up. Keep going, keep going until you start to feel the effects. But CBD works great for inflammation. I have many pediatric patients with epilepsy or uh, treatment-resistant um, seizure disorders that have done very well on CBD oil. Usually a, a high dose is required. We're talking in the hundreds of milligrams. Um, I have a number of patients with schizophrenia that I'm treating with uh, CBD with very little THC who have done really well as CBD can be an antipsychotic either in addition to their medication or instead of their medication. But of course, that should be medically supervised as well as children with epilepsy. Many patients with chronic pain, many patients with anxiety, the studies clearly show that CBD is a uh, very good anti-anxiety medication that is not addictive, that if you miss a dose, you don't feel terrible, that you can uh, take regularly or you can take as needed. Um, again, the big thing that I find a problem is about 99% of patients who have tried CBD, who come to see me and say it doesn't work, they're underdosing. And I think that's part of the problem is that um, people just need help with dosing. When you're looking at studies, they're using hundreds of milligrams. I, I think it's a great call out of it. Typically, you know, and I, I read a study at Mayo Clinic uh, that was saying, you know, for some people it's five milligrams, for some people it's 400. You know, you're, as you're saying, there is a huge, huge wide range there of the doses. I know for myself personally, I can start to feel a little bit of a calming effect around that 20 milligrams, but most often for me, it's closer to definitely that 40 to 50 milligrams is when I personally start to notice more. I sleep better at night uh, for myself. And so I know I've used a CBD oil, uh, certified organic CBD oil. And um, again, for me, biggest benefits I've noticed was sleep i mean for myself so talk to me about sleep talk to me about you know the cbd have you found and as you work with people any benefits for gut disorders any benefits for anxiety any of those conditions right so um for sleep it's interesting cbd in low doses is known to be alerting it actually can give you energy in the lower doses in higher doses it's more calming and again the cutoff between low and high is individual. Some people need 40 milligrams, like you mentioned, Josh, and then some people need 200 milligrams to feel that sleep effect. In a study um, that was published a few years ago that looked at CBD for people with insomnia and anxiety, there was a very nice anti-anxiety effects that were actually lasting for months and months and months. Wow. For sleep, which is interesting, is people had improved sleep in the beginning, and then some of them started to report that it wasn't holding, but some people did. And that's at the point at which I would say to somebody, if you notice that CBD is working well for sleep, but you start to lose that effect, you have a couple of options. One is to up your dose. You will not develop tolerance. There appears to be no tolerance to CBD. You can dial up your dose. And if that doesn't help, then maybe try something with a little more THC content in it that might help. What's interesting about cannabinoids um, is that there appears to be what we call bidirectional or biphasic properties. At low doses, you get one effect, and at a higher dose, you get a different effect. So if you don't get the effect you're looking for at a low dose, don't throw it out. Try a higher dose. The one thing that I'd like to say about CBD, too, is that CBD is processed in the liver at what we call the cytochrome P450 system. It's an enzyme system in your liver that helps you break down uh, compounds so that you can, it's, your liver is your filter. Um, for those people that are on certain medications, like if you've been warned about grapefruit interactions or so on, that tells us 
that you may want to be careful with your CBD dosing if you're on a medication that is um, processed through the liver. Now, in my experience, which is now 12 years, thousands and thousands and thousands of patients, I really do not see very many drug-drug interactions, but I always put it out there that you have to be careful. What are the big, the ones to be worried about? Blood thinners, if you're on those, epilepsy medications, and also some of the newer cancer drugs that they call immunotherapy type drugs. Those are the ones that I'm going to call out. If you're on those, be careful. By the way, low-dose CBD is very unlikely to interact with these. It's usually much higher doses in the hundreds of milligrams. And even then, it's still theoretical and potential. But again, you might want to work with a doctor to make sure that it's safe for you to combine those. So, okay, list of conditions. Let's go through this again. So we've got sleep. You mentioned anxiety. Well, what along with those two where, 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 where somebody's saying, okay, I, I want to, again, what other conditions sure. or health goals would somebody take CBD for? Right. So inflammatory pain, you mentioned gut disorders. So I have had patients who have been able to turn around inflammatory uh, uh, bowel disease with uh, cannabinoids. Now, CBD may be the one that does it for somebody. I'll give you an example. I'm taking care of a young man that has ulcerative colitis and it's CBD combined with some of the other cannabinoids that people may not have heard of. TH, yep. CBG, THCA, CBDA. If there's an A at the end, you know it's from the raw plant. It's not been heated up when they uh, make the product. THC and CBD, by the way, occur in very tiny amounts in the raw plant. And the way they're made is people heat them up. So if you're making a CBD tincture in that process, it has been heated. If you find a THC product in the process, it's been heated up. And this is why people either bake cannabis and brownies or you know, smoke it, they're applying heat to convert it to create THC. But all of these other compounds are not intoxicating. They're all anti-inflammatory. THCA, CBDA are anti-nausea. So if you're a person that gets migraine headaches or that you're having nausea from some other, let's say you have acid reflux that you haven't been able to find the answer to, these compounds can be anti-nausea, um, anti-vomiting. One of the other things that uh, we use CBD for is topically. So it can be made into a product that you rub on. So let's say you have arthritis in your wrists. Topical CBD is phenomenal for that for many people. Um, my own uh, family member who gets drug tested for his job um, because of the nature of the job, cannot take cannabis, even CBD products internally, unless they're really pure, pure, pure CBD. And he doesn't want to risk it. So for his uh, ankle pain and his shoulder pain and his back pain, he's using topical cannabis, dominant CBD with great results. And again, it won't show up in a blood test because it's not absorbed systemically, but it can give you wonderful results. Wow. Talking about the endocannabinoid system. So this is something I think is uh, so fascinating for so many people. We have all these different systems in our body. We have our nervous system. We have our respiratory system, our cardiovascular system. We have all these different systems in our body. But just today, we're starting to discover and learn more about this endocannabinoid system. What, it, what is that exactly? So it was only discovered in 1988. While they were looking to figure out how THC made people intoxicated, they came across this receptor. Uh, the receptor they named a cannabinoid receptor because it was binding to the cannabinoid THC. And what scientists realized is all receptors that we have in our body. So for instance, everybody's heard of serotonin. We have serotonin receptors. We have dopamine. We have dopamine receptors. So all these receptors we have in our body, we make a compound that binds to it. So the way to think about a receptor is like a lock, and these compounds are the key, and they recognize each other, and they bind together. So scientists discover this receptor that binds to THC, and they realize we don't have this receptor for THC. We have this receptor because we must make a compound that binds to it. And so further research revealed that we make these compounds called endo for within cannabinoids. Mm. For lack of a better term, Josh, inner cannabis. We make our own inner cannabis compounds. And that's really kind of where the explosion of research into the endocannabinoid system began. And what was discovered, very simply put, is this system exists 
to help us maintain balance of the messages our cells are sending. And it goes into action when you need it. Think about a football player, he gets clunked on the head during a game. His endocannabinoid system goes into action right at that moment to help balance any kind of damage, to help repair, recover from that damage that was that takes place after you've been injured. So if you think about this, the way I like to look at it is you're a boat on the ocean and you're floating along and injury, infection, illness comes and tilts you. And your endocannabinoid system comes kicks in and says, oh, let's get back into balance. So when we think of somebody who's getting chemotherapy and has terrible nausea, I mean, they're being poisoned, right? They're getting a poison into their bloodstream and their brain says, oh, vomit, nausea, get rid of it, feel terrible. Your endocannabinoid system goes into action to try to balance that. And sometimes it's overwhelming on the injury or insult side and your endocannabinoid system cannot necessarily respond. And that's where augmentation of that system by this natural plant that contains the similar compounds can be really helpful. You know, I think one of the things that's so incredible, you bring up so many good points, but you know, when you look, and people can simply, if you're listening to this uh, on, our, on our podcast or you're watching this on YouTube, you know, go, go, go to your computer now or later and just search endocannabinoid system. So it's endo, E-O, E-N-D-O, cannabinoid, which if you're close, Google will help you spell it right, and system. And then you can click on images and, and you can look at all of the different systems of the body that, you know, CBD and this whole endocannabinoid system, what, what all they're linked to. I know from when I've worked with uh, patients in the past and people today, one of the things that I noticed, Bonnie, is that I think that this system is also very closely tied to our sympathetic and our specifically our parasympathetic nervous system. So many of us live in this fight or flight state today of just being sort of like from blue light, you know, is one big reason in our, uh, our, our, our devices and driving in cars, the whole thing. You know, we have a lot of stimulants today. And I think CBD can be so beneficial because it helps really calm that sympathetic nervous system. Any, any thoughts there? There is no question that you're right about that. Um, When you're being chased by a bear in the woods, you want to have that anxiety, run, 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 okay? But when you're walking down the street or driving on the freeway or on a Zoom call, that overwhelming anxiety, that overwhelming feeling of everything's out of control, that's not helpful to you. And that kind of, and remember that spills over into other systems in your body that react and create inflammation. So, being able to balance your endocannabinoid system, and again, balancing it, augmenting it, can be very helpful. What's interesting is that we are finding out that some that the endocannabinoid system may also, when it's dysfunctional, may be the root cause of some diseases. So it's very important to understand it can be, as a result, you can, can kind of um, burn through your endocannabinoid system, and now it can't keep up, and usually that's chronic illness over time. I find that chronic stress, sleep deprivation, poor diet, all of that leads to an endocannabinoid system that's being overworked and can't keep up. But at the same time, it also may be the first thing that gets out of whack. And if, for instance, I'll I'll give you a good example. There's a number of studies that show that children with autism are missing their natural inner cannabis Mm. or that it's deficient. Wow. You would not leave somebody deficient in vitamin D or, you know, we know insulin deficiency in people is type 1 diabetes. And what do we do? We replace that. Um, I always tell people you don't want to leave yourself in a deficient state because, again, you're kind of that boat that's tipped over. And I have found that for some of these patients with autism, when we replace or augment the endocannabinoid system, you start to see benefits. It's not magic. We know where it works in the body. We know how it works. And what's important is to understand that it's not as simple as just replacing, like for insulin, you know, you take an injection of insulin and it brings your sugar down. It's not quite that simple. But again, because it's so safe, trial and error and taking the time to work through, you will likely find a regimen that will work for you. You just have to be patient in order to find it. Anything that's natural. You know, I, I joke around, you can't expect cannabis to work in a day. If I'm out of shape and I hit the gym tomorrow, I'm not in shape tomorrow night. Anything natural is going to take time. You have to give it a chance and hang in there with it. Yeah, I think it's great advice. 
One of the last questions I have for you is, what do you think the future looks like? As we're talking about, I mean, I think we've seen some amazing progress in the past five years, especially uh, on the legal front. Uh, I know we need to see more, but what do you think, what, what do you think in 10 years, what, what do you think the landscape's gonna look like for CBD by itself, for uh, you know, cannabis as medicine, and just generally how it's, how it's used? Well, I think uh, there's a, a, a couple of things to mention there. One is research, research, research. It would be really helpful. Look, I'm practicing medicine, helping people with cannabis, but I always have to tell them, you know, if you have cancer and you come to me and ask me to help you, I have to share with you, there are no clinical trials. I don't know how long you may have to take this. I don't know which combination of cannabinoids and terpenes is going to kill your cancer we need to be able to do the research. So getting cannabis off the schedule one of the Controlled Substance Act should be a priority. And I always tell people, I don't wanna get political, but please, before you vote somebody, see what their stance is on this and vote for people who are looking at allowing the scientists to do the research. There's no reason in the year 2020 for us to not have the answers to these questions. I think the other part, which is really good news, Josh, is that physicians, naturopaths, uh, chiropractors, acupuncturists, uh, nurse practitioners, and so on are all starting to include cannabis medicine as an option. The same way we're now all embracing nutrition as an important part of your health. We cannot just go to the pills and surgery or you know, say, oh, sorry, we don't have anything for you. We have to embrace uh, what mother nature has given us, right? F good food out of the ground, and um, plant medicine. Now, phytonutrients have a tremendous um, have tremendous benefit in human health, and I think that's what I'm seeing is more and more people in the healthcare world embracing cannabis, which then leads to more patients getting the help that they need. Yeah, and, and I, I I do see. I, I think we're going to see continue to see more things open up in the future, and I think we're going to see C CBD generally. It, it's interesting. It's it's sold in stores across the country, but yet it's legal, you know, anyways, it's a whole, it's a, you know, it's legal yeah. statewide, not necessarily federally. It's a just, but it's not enforced. So anyways, maybe we'll do a topic for another show, but want to encourage you guys, check out Dr. Bonnie's book. It's called Cannabis is Medicine. You can find it at barnesandnoble.com. You can find it on amazon.com. Go and check it out. If you want to continue to learn more about the science, more about how to use it personally for yourself or someone you love. If you have health goals that uh, you want to help someone else in your family achieve, again, check out the book, Cannabis is Medicine. I want to thank you, Dr. Bonnie, uh, for coming on the show today. Thanks so much, Josh. All right. Hey, everybody. Have a great week. Hey, and continue to research yourself. Look up Dr. Bonnie Goldstein. You can find her online. Again, check out her book and just continue to research more about the benefits, specifically about CBD as well. The benefits can be tremendous. Thanks, everybody. And thank you again, Dr. Bonnie. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. 